Who's like God? No one's like God. Receive a greeting of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Ariana Valareso. Ariana is a Catholic psychologist graduated from the Pontificio Catholic University, specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy and rational emotive therapy. She works with adolescents and adults. We are interviewing Ariana today because she had a near-death experience in which she was in a coma and witnessed something supernatural. Without a doubt, the Blessed Virgin Mary rescued Ariana through Ariana's consecration to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart and wanted her to share her testimony with Bonds of Mary and Love today. So Ariana, our first question for you is, how was your life before this experience? Thank you, Samantha. And thank you for the opportunity of, of um, speaking tonight. Uh, thank the Lord, first of all, for this opportunity. Well, um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I was born and raised in a Catholic uh, family. My parents were always very uh, close to God and to Mary. I have an older sister and she was always very devout too. So I grew up in a household where we, all, we were always praying, we were always going to church together on Sundays. Uh, we always prayed the rosary and there was a lot of devotion for, for God and for Mary. So um, I remember a very happy childhood with my family. We, um, we were always together, the four of us. And um, I got the seed of, of faith in my heart since I was very, very little. So. Um, it was a very, very child, a very happy childhood in general. I have very nice memories of, of, um, of being with my family and being together. And uh, well, I started growing up, I, I attended a, an, a school where we didn't get a lot of, of Catholic information. So, and I had a group of friends. Uh, it was a, a, a school only for girls. I'm sorry if my English is not perfect sometimes, so please bear with me. Um, but in, the, in this school, I had a group of, of very close friends and um, we grew up together. And I was always very, a very, uh, a girl who was always interested in, in getting to know the world and getting to know everything that the world has to offer. And also very interested in, in and very keen to, to explore and to, um, discover things of all different types of things um, and also um, things that were forbidden so I remember for example when I was like 11 or 12 I had my first cigarette I, I just wanted to, to explore the world and explore everything so um, when I was around 14 or 15 I started going to parties with my friends I started getting to know boys um, we had a group of friends who were boys and we, we went to these parties together. Um, I remember at 14, I started to see people drinking alcohol, for example, and I was very interested in, in um, tasting everything and in discovering all kinds of things. So this was like my personality since I was very little. And um, my mom saw that, that this was happening and she wanted to protect me. So she started setting some rules in the in the family, and she started trying to put some um, uh, some rules for me, so that I I was kind of protected from from all this that I was starting to discover. And being being a very temperamental teenager, I started to drift apart from her. So what I wanted was to have total independence and to be absolutely um, free to do whatever I wanted. So when I didn't get this, I just started to drift apart from the family. And my main goal in life when I was like 15, 16 was to be 18 years old so that I would be a grown up and would be able to do whatever I wanted. So um, this didn't happen, of course. I, I, I was still living in my, in my house and had to, to respect the rules of the house. I remember we all had to go to church always every Sunday and I was like, I didn't like it. I, I, I started to, to find more interest in my friends and in, in these uh, parties and new friends that I was making. Um, and I just started drifting apart from faith. I remember that clearly. I, I, 
I didn't feel um, very interested in praying anymore or in going to mass, for example. Um, I found it kind of boring. And um, well, I finished school kind of early when I was 15 and I started studying psychology in university. So I met all kinds of people in this, in this university. It's a very big university with all kind, like more than 30 careers. So I started meeting different people with different um, backgrounds and um, ways of thinking and started to discover all these other uh, theories and, and religions and ways of thinking. And I remember thinking maybe what I was taught in, in, in my house is not the complete truth. Maybe there are other truths that I, that I still have to, to discover. So little by little, very subtly, I started to question what I had learned about faith and about God. Um, and I remember starting to think maybe some things that I thought were a sin are not really a sin. Maybe I have been too strict with myself. Maybe the Catholic Church is too strict. And uh, just started questioning everything in my mind, <clears throat> which is something that usually happens when one is discovering the world, right? So um, when I was 22, I applied for an internship in Canada because I wanted to travel. And I went to do, to study my last year of, of uh, psychology in Canada. So I was living in this small village, a small town with no grown-ups there, only parties and only young people. And it was just party after party every single day. And I remember meeting all kinds of people who had different ways of living. Um, I saw everyone having, you know, sexual relations. It was like the most normal thing. And I remember thinking, wow, maybe I have been um, blind to all this other reality. And maybe this is what I want. So I started like, you know, getting confused and getting uh, caught up in all these new things that I was seeing and I was experiencing. I, I was having boyfriends. I was experiencing um, relationships with them. And all my friends, all the people around me thought uh, that all this was normal, that, you know, premarital sex is normal, alcohol, drugs, and everything. And I was surrounded by this environment and I was starting to incorporate some new ideas. I remember I, I, did, I was never a very liberal person, but I did start to think that some, that maybe the truth wasn't the truth that I had been taught and that maybe some things were not as bad as I had thought they, they were. So I remember coming back to Peru after this internship and all I wanted to do was go to live by myself. So I told my parents, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to start living away. They were really sad about this decision. I was, I was 23, so I, I started living alone, first with a cousin and then on my own. And then it was like, just uh, my life was in my own hands with no supervision. And I just started um, living the life that the world offers us. So from Monday to Friday, I was working like crazy. And then all the weekend I was just partying. And this was the way that I thought I had to live because everyone around me did it. So I thought it was like the normal thing that is expected from us, you know, just working and partying all the time. So I never had time for myself. I never wanted to have time to, um, to think about my life or to uh, reflect on anything. All I wanted was to be surrounded by people, by noise, by friends. I, I started to travel a lot. Um, I started going to, to exercising a lot. And uh, I was also watching these shows on TV, I remember for many years, these shows that uh, <clears throat> like inter entertainment, for example, that show us all these, um, these beautiful women. And it's like this stereotype of who we have to be to be successful. So I, I really started to think that I had to be like that. I had to be beautiful like that. And I had to have all of those material things to be successful in life. So I just worked so hard to get all, all these things. And I thought money was so important and beauty was so important um, because I, I was seeing these women that like always very happy. So no one really cared if they were happy or not as long as they looked beautiful. So I, I spent a lot of money on beauty products 
on trying to be thin and trying to be fit on on just um, being part of this stereotype that I was seeing. And well, I started, I was studying psychology, I, I finished and then um, in this psychology career, we were taught, um, there was like this bias in the, in the, in the career um, that now I recognize, but I didn't recognize at, the, at that time, uh, which taught us that there is no one truth, for example, no one, not only one truth, but many different truths. And that um, as counselors and as psychologists, we are not in the position to judge anyone that everyone has their own reality and their own truth. And we have to be very tolerant with people. We were taught not to, not to say the word good or bad, for example. Like everyone has their own truth and their own vision of the world and their own experience. And everything is exactly as valid as, as the other. So that was really uh, a new thing for me just to start thinking that there is not one, one truth, but many truths, and that we have to respect all of them, and that there is nothing good or bad, that everything is, um, is valid as long as it is functional for the person. So I really didn't uh, agree with that, but I started to incorporate that into my life and into the therapy that I started giving my patients. So I was really starting to be very confused about things. Um, I remember just a very crazy schedule that I had. I wanted to fill every single hour of my day always with work, with friends, with parties, with traveling, with exercise. I, I, um, I was doing all these things, but at the same time, I, I was feeling very empty. And I started to recognize that this emptiness was not going away. I was achieving all these goals that I had in my, in my mind and that everyone said that I had to achieve. But at the same time, I was feeling more and more empty and more lost all the time. So what I did was trying to, to find some, uh, some peace. I started reading all these books about um, you know, how to feel more happy, how to relax, um, autoayuda, I don't know how you say that in English, um, but all these books that uh, tell us about how to find uh, happiness and fulfillment in life. Uh, I read all the books, I read all the theories, but I still didn't feel like I was, I felt happy and, and fulfilled. I was always feeling this void inside me, like there was something that was not right in my life but I didn't really know what it was. And I remember thinking, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do that, that I see on TV and that I see in successful people. And I still feel lost. I still feel like I have no purpose in life, that I'm completely um, empty inside. So I, what is going on? What is wrong? What am I doing wrong? So I started experiencing with all kinds of therapies. Um, like new age therapies, you know, like uh, alternative therapies. And I just started trying to, uh, just trying to, 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 to find peace. So the first thing I did was uh, I started practicing yoga. I started learning how to do uh, Reiki and also um, family constellations, this therapy. I also did uh, hypnosis, you know, and also with the stones and the energy. I, I always believed a lot in, in this energy and that I had, and that I could achieve uh, relaxation and, and, um, and feel better uh, working with the energy and all these kinds of uh, therapies. But uh, the more I learned about them and the more I, I practiced them, the more empty I felt. I felt and the more um, lost and the more, um, I don't know, I, I, I really didn't feel happy inside. I remember coming back from a party one night, very late and I just started crying in my room because I, I just couldn't, couldn't handle it anymore. I was feeling absolutely lost. This was maybe until I was like 
28, 29 years old. Well, thank you for sharing, um, Ariana. And I, I can't help but notice, but we're both wearing the, the same medal, the miraculous medal. So if you don't mind me asking, when did you first hear about the consecration to Jesus through Mary? Yeah, I, um, when I was about 28, I did this, before telling you this, uh, I did this uh, therapy that we have here in, the, in Peru. Uh, in the Andes region, it's called ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is, is a medicinal um, plant. And what we do is we drink the plant and we, we start to, to um, it's really a drug. So what we have is like a, um, a trip, you know, like a mental trip, like any drug and you just get out of your body and everything. And I did this two times because I was told this would heal me inside because this is a very powerful plant. And the shamans use this in the, in the Andes. But what happened with this plant and with this supposed therapy it was that I started after I did the, the, the therapy I, and I started you know, having this horrible trip and seeing horrible things. I really saw very horrible creatures and things and a very bad experience. What happened after that was that I didn't know that I was opening spiritual doors um, and that I started and these spiritual doors were open because I, uh, I did it twice. And then I started noticing that something inside me was not right anymore. I started feeling afraid. I didn't want to sleep alone. I started um, seeing shadows in my house. I felt there was a presence that was watching me all night. I couldn't sleep. I started taking sleeping pills and I, I just started, you know, um, going down this horrible void, this horrible um, hole inside me, I felt like something is very wrong inside me. So, um, but I didn't know really what to do because you don't know what to do when these things, spiritual things happen. You, you, you don't understand what is happening. And what my friends told me was, wow, you opened a third eye and now you're able to see new things and you're in, in a spiritual level where you can sense more things and I was like no I, I I never wanted this all I wanted was to be healed these are very very um uh these are things that we shouldn't really do if we don't know where they come from and and I was very naive I didn't know so when I was 30 years old my dad invited me he's always been very devout to Mary and my dad invited me to do this consecration to Jesus through Mary I think he did it because he saw that I was really lost and that I was going through all these things. I told him about these, this horrible thing that I was experiencing and I didn't know how to get rid of it. I was very, very scared actually when I started feeling all these things and it went on for almost a year. So he invited me to do the consecration and he said, I know this will help you. Um, so, well, I, I, I'm very close to my dad and I really trust him. So I said, okay, let's do this together. I didn't really know what the consecration was, uh, but I knew if it was something related to, to Mary, it was going to be very good for me. So I, I agreed to do it. And we did the preparation for 33 days together. We did all, all the prayers and then we did the consecration. And, um, I started after the consecration, I started to feel like something inside me changed. Um, like a very subtle thing started to happen. I wanted to, 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 um, to go to church more. I, I wanted to, to receive confession. I started feeling like, like I really needed to be closer to God for some reason. And I didn't, I didn't um, notice that until later, but I went back to confession and little by little, I started praying a little bit more. But of course, I was still in the world with all these things, with all these um, tendencies and all these chains that I had. And I always went back. So I, it was like I was running toward God. But then I, I always went back to the world and to, and to my sins and to my old ways. So um, it was like, I think that is when something started changing inside me for good. <clears throat> thank you for sharing um also just um 
continuing on with the interview, uh, when did your near-death experience happen? And can you describe this supernatural experience? I know um, you may not be able to describe everything because, you know, like words aren't enough to describe the love of God. But if, if you can describe what it is that maybe you saw, what was going on in your life at the time, how did you feel? Yeah, I was um, at I was 33 years old and I was uh, dating someone and I got pregnant. So I decided to have the baby. I, I always knew inside me that a life, that life is sacred, you know. Um, so I decided to have a baby and I prepared myself physically. But at the moment of birth, I had to have a C-section. So um, in this C-section, uh, a bacteria uh, went into my body. And it started infecting everything. So I went home after giving birth and I started feeling sick. I felt that all my that I, I couldn't move all the left part of the left side of my body. It was very, it was it was like stiff and, and very hot. And I had a fever, so I went back to the hospital and they told me you have a um, I don't know how it's the word in English, but it's sepsis, septicemia, like a general infection. Oh. Um and it's very, very, uh, it's a very bad infection that, I, that you have, that you get with these, these uh, aggressive bacteria. So this bacteria had infected every single organ of my body. So I, I was told you have to get, you have to um, have surgery tonight. And I remember feeling so scared. I really didn't know what was happening, but I knew it was bad. I was in the hospital room and I remember the priest, a priest appeared. It was like 11 p.m. And my mom um, called the priest. He was a friend of the family and he came, he was smiling. And he said, I, I came to give you the sacraments. And I was like, I didn't understand why. I didn't, I really didn't know I was so, I was so sick. So he gave me confession, communion and um, uh, holy oils. The anointing of the sick. Sorry, the anointing of the sick. And I started feeling like a very big peace inside me at that moment. I, after I received the sacraments, a peace, a very deep peace in my soul, like I hadn't felt for many years. Then I remember going into the surgery operation room and my mom was crying and crying. And I thought, I don't know what is happening, but it's not good. Well, they opened me up and they found that I was totally infected and they had to, to put me into a, a coma for two days. And in those two days that I was in a coma, um, our Lord allowed me to have a vision. Uh, and after that, the vision, he told me that uh, he wanted me to tell the world about this vision um, for his glory. So the first thing that I experienced was going out of my body. I realized that I didn't have a physical body anymore that I was just a, like a spirit. And I started going down into a spiritual place. It was like, imagine a, a big concert, a very big concert in a very big place, but it was like um, eternal. It, it didn't have an end, this place that I saw. And it was absolutely dark. There was no light in this place. Um, there was like no air, no fresh air. Everything was like closed. You couldn't breathe very well. And the, the smells were absolutely um, horrible. It was in the floor of this place, there were many things. All the things that are under the earth were there. For example, there were bugs, insects, um, uh, there were rats, there was blood, feces, everything that is under the earth was there. So imagine the, the smells, it was, it, was really, um, it was really bad. And there was no light. There was the absence of light, but not the visual light, but the light of the spirit. Because in this place, there was absolutely no love. There was the absence, the total absence of love. So there was all kinds of feelings and all kinds of uh, things, but no love. So when I arrived at this place and I started going and moving inside, what I felt was terror. I started feeling terror and anxiety. 
And I started thinking, why am I here? I don't belong here. I started seeing all kinds of, um, of things happening all at the same time. And I could understand them. I got the, the wisdom at that moment to understand what I was, what I was seeing. Uh, I saw uh, war, people killing themselves with weapons. And I saw a lot of people dying and, and blood. Uh, then I saw poverty. I saw many people dying of, of hunger, like small children um, from Africa or from different countries who were dying in this place uh, and also grown-ups dying. I, saw, I then saw everything related to the sin of, uh, of lust, all kinds of scenes, very, very, um, um, how do you say, very strong scenes and actions related to lust. I saw the prostitutes, I saw um, children being used for pornography. I, I saw um, couples having all kinds of, of uh, sexual actions. And what I was seeing in these people was that inside them, there was no light. It was like inside their, 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 their hearts, it was absolutely dark. And it was happening in all these in all these people that I was watching, even though some of them were smiling or even laughing, I could see that there was no light inside them. And I started to understand that all of them had been um, deceived and they had been lied to and they had bought the, this lie, this big lie, but they didn't know it. So they were, they were just uh, immersed in a lie, in a big lie. And then what I saw were huge mansions like those we see on TV with very rich people inside. They were, they were men and women. They were all beautiful and they were drinking and eating and they were laughing and, and looking at their jewels and their clothes and everything. And again, I could see that inside them, there was no light. It was, it was dark. And then I saw everything related to the, um, to the body, people who were exercising desperately and they were like looking at their perfect bodies, men and women, perfect people, beautiful. And all of them were obsessed with their bodies and with their image. And again, inside them, there was no light. And I understood more and more that we had all been lied to and that we had, um, we had um, decided to buy this lie, this big lie. And that that was the reason we were all there. And all this millions and millions or i don't know thousands of people were um worshiping one being that i saw in the middle and this this um this being uh, was represented for me like a beautiful woman she was a perfect woman and she was she was very uh, i saw her very um similar to marilyn monroe she was very very beautiful and sexy and she was giving each person what what they were what they wanted so she was giving every single person um, what they wanted to have and when she saw me coming she recognized me and she called me by my name she said ariana hi hello come um i can give you whatever you want you just have to adore me and i remember answering i know who you are and you you cannot deceive me and also you're a woman so you don't attract me and she looked at me she smiled and she said, don't worry, I can turn into anything you want. And she started turning into this beautiful, beautiful boy, a beautiful man. And I remember at that moment feeling absolutely terrified because I realized that this being was, was, um, was evil, that he really knew me very well and that, and, and that he wanted to offer me exactly what I was, what I wanted. So, um, this was like a, a very a spiritual struggle that started at that moment. For me, it lasted like a million years. It was very intense. It was very scary. And I just started to pray. My soul just started to pray because I was so terrified, you know? And I, and I remember thinking, God, please have mercy on me. Please, God, have mercy on me. Don't let me, um, don't let me, um, accept this temptation, please. I love you. 
I'm your daughter and I love you. I think it was the first time in my life that I said, I love you, God, with all my heart, you know, and, and in an honest, in an honest way. And at that moment, I felt like a, a big hand that just appeared and started to, um, to take me out of this place. So I, uh, I remember start, I started to, to go upwards out of this place, of this horrifying place. I, I remember my feeling of, of anxiety, of desperation, of fear started to just um, to vanish. And I started to feel peace. And I just started going up. I heard this amazing music, this beautiful, perfect melody, like thousands and thousands of, of children singing the most perfect melody that I have never really heard ever after. And I, uh, I saw this blue light. It was a light blue light. It was very, very strong, stronger than the sun. I, I saw it there and I was going there. And I remember thinking, I'm going to see God. I'm going to see God. And I just felt so happy and so excited. Um, so I, I, I kept moving until I reached this, um, this, this place, the spiritual place. And I, it was like I was um, allowed to lift the veil a little bit. And I started to receive God's love. Um, it was like rivers and rivers and rivers of love that I was receiving. It, it's, it, we cannot describe it with words, like you said, because it's not the, the love that we know here. It's, it's the most overwhelming, perfect, absolute love that he has. So it's really difficult to describe. But what I remember is my spirit thinking, wow, I, have, I am now in my home. I am in the place where I belong. This is where I wanted to be all my life. And it, it's just a, a feeling of peace, of fulfillment, of absolute joy. Um, and I and I was receiving all his love. And I remember I didn't understand why does God love me so much? It's just me. This is just me. It was like someone, uh, it was like I was allowed to see myself like I really was. And with all my, my humanity, and I realized how I had lived a very uh, empty life, that I had not used my life for anything good, that I had just lived apart from God, and that I had not used any of the gifts he gave me for him, to praise him, and that um, I didn't have anything to give back. I really wanted to give back because your soul wants to give back something to this to, to, to God when he's loving you so much, but I didn't have anything. I was empty handed and I felt really sad and really um, ashamed at that moment. It, it's a very, it's a horrible feeling because you realize how little you are. And I, I kept receiving this love. Uh, I wanted to stay there. I really didn't want to go back to life. I remember, I didn't even remember my, my baby at that at that moment, it's, it was just God, his presence, his absolute presence, and my soul. I remember feeling the presence of Mary too, because I felt a very maternal presence, um, but I didn't see her, but I knew she was there. Um, and then I, I, real, I understood that this wasn't my moment yet, that I had to go back, and that this was my second chance and my last chance. Um, so I started going back. I remember opening my eyes and I was in ICU. I didn't understand what was happening. I was really scared. Uh, um, and then the doctor came in and I remember telling him, well, I, I had a tube. I was being fed by a tube so I couldn't talk, but I, I wrote on a paper and I said, I, I saw something. And I remember my mom telling me, uh, write it down so that you don't forget. So I started to write it down. And I, I stayed in the hospital for 28 days after that because I still had to get better and had more surgeries. And I had a lot of physical pain, but it, I remember I felt a lot of peace in my heart. And I didn't really understand why. I remember telling the doctor I had seen something and he said, it happens all the time. It's part of the anesthesia. It's just a hallucination that you had and don't worry about it. But I knew it was something else because of the peace that I felt inside me. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very, very, 
it was an amazing experience. Praise God. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so what role would you say the consecration or your consecration to Jesus through Mary had in this experience and how did this supernatural vision change your life? I know that you mentioned um, not seeing the Virgin Mary, but feeling her maternal love. Do you think that's a, a fruit of the consecration of just being able to recognize her presence in, in your life? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure that when you consecrate yourself, to, uh, uh, like all yourself to her, she starts acting in, in amazing ways. She's just like, we are hers. So I know that she was, she just took me when I, when I did the consecration and she said, I'm going to save this, this child. And she was there all the way. And, um, when I, when I went back home, um, I started seeing th things in a different way. Like my eyes were different. I, I started seeing people in life and everything in a different way. And one of the first things that I experienced was the pain in my heart when I was sinning. So I was living with a person at that time with my partner, but I just didn't want to hurt God anymore. Something inside me had changed and I just couldn't hurt him anymore. So I remember I started thinking I have to change many things in my life because I cannot um, keep hurting God. I don't want to have uh, a mortal sin anymore. So um, what I did, well, it was like a process. It wasn't very, very, it wasn't that quick. It took me a while, but I decided to to separate and I started living with my, with my baby. And then I said, okay, God, now that I'm living alone with my baby, I want to live in chastity. I want to do, to devote my life and my body to you. At first it was very difficult because I was not praying enough. I was, I kept doing the same things that I, that I did before I was going back to my old ways so it was very hard until um I said no if I want to do it I have to do it 100% so I decided to stop to just stop the old ways and I um I remember saying okay god I'm devoting my life to you now um everything that I'm going to do from now on is going to be for you so my life is yours my body is yours and this time it's 100% and I remember I started praying more. I started praying the rosary daily. I started going to the sacraments. I discovered the beauty of the sacrament, confession, communion, every single week. I started going to mass more frequently because I, I really wanted to receive Jesus in my heart um, more frequently. I, I needed the grace. I felt like I needed grace, like I needed water, you know, like I really needed it. So when the grace started to to um to pour into me it was much easier to be consistent with the decisions that i was making and the rosary the rosary was so important because it was just like opening the door to mary to act in my life and to and to guide me so the rosary for me now is like something i do every single day it's the moment when I when I talk to her. It's not only repeating um, repeating words. It's talking to her. It's communicating with Mary, and I feel her with me. And I I know that she's with me. Um, even when I'm praying, sometimes I I, I really feel that she's there it, um, with her intercession for me. So um, everything started to change, and it wasn't easy. Like I say, it was very hard. <clears throat> Um, because uh, I had to I had to be consistent with the, with the decisions that I was making. And, but I felt so much joy and so much peace with my, with this new life and with knowing that I was trying to do God's will in my life. And that now he was the one who is guiding me in, through my life. And that joy and that peace is, is absolutely amazing. And it, Everything else that I did before doesn't compare at all to knowing that we are walking with Jesus and, and that Jesus is with us, taking our hands step by step. By step. But that is only possible when we, when we are in prayer, in constant prayer. And um, so it's been five years 
now that I've been on this on this road. Um, I've been discovering more and more amazing things, but uh, I think the most important thing is is the rosary and the sacraments because they are the source of of grace in our life, and they are the ones who allow us to be to to stay um, strong in the battle, in the spiritual battle. Amen. Ariana, thank you so much for this interview. And before we wrap up. Um, is there any message that you'd like to give to the youth, teenagers who may be dealing with some of your past experiences of doing yoga and Reiki and all these alternative medicines and, and may find themselves in that situation of, of feeling emptiness, but desiring something greater than to themselves or, or any words of motivation um, for those looking to get consecrated for those watching this video? Yeah, I can. I, what I can say is I tried all those things. I tried all the therapies, um, all the books. I, I really researched a lot and I tried everything, trying to fill this emptiness that I had and trying to find a, um, a purpose in my life. And not, nothing really works. The only real spiritual doctor is, is the Lord. And uh, he was the, the only one who could really break the chains that I had. I, I remember after two years, after this experience, I was in, in deep prayer and, I, and he started asking me, do you want to be healed? And I, I remember saying, yes, please, please Lord, heal me. <laughs> and he did, he broke the chains. At that moment, it was like, something happened inside me like I had surgery you imagine spiritual surgery and all these chains were broken all these chains of low self-esteem of um of the vices that I had you know of this emptiness of this constant looking for um for a companion in my life or to be loved all those things that we all experience that many of us experience all those things that emptiness that um a frustration, those pains that I had with my mother from childhood, all those things that hadn't been healed in 36 years were just broken and they were healed. But they were only healed by him, by God, because he's the only one who can really heal our spirit and our heart. But he did it. He healed me because I said, yes, please, I want to be healed. I, it was like I gave him like permission to do it. And he's very respectful of our of our um, um, our oh, free will. Yeah. So yeah. at that moment when I said yes, it was like he, the spirit, the Holy Spirit just came inside me, and I felt wow, he was healing me. So um, what I can tell, what I can say for everyone who is watching is, don't believe all the things that the world is offering us because those things are just. Um, they are, um, they give you happiness for a little while and then they just vanish. Real happen you will only find real happiness and fulfillment in your life with Jesus Christ. Um, and just to, to wrap up and finish, um, what I would advise young people who are watching this is, um, what I would say is don't lose faith. Don't lose faith that we are not alone, that um, God is alive. God is not just a, a beautiful story. God is alive. And he's full of love for us. He really loves us. He loves us just like we are. We don't need to change anything to be loved. We are already loved by him. So um, I think that's what really changed my life and my heart. Just realizing that God loves me so much. And he loves us, each one of us, so much. He just wants us to be happy. And to have this amazing, happy life. Um, close to him he wants us to be free so don't lose faith don't lose faith in, in God and that our mother Mary is with us all the way she's she's just helping us to get closer to her son um, so we need to keep praying we need to keep the faith we we need to be hopeful that um, he's always with us and our main goal is is to be in heaven for eternity so everything that we that we have to do in this life to get there is nothing because our goal is to be with him 
enjoying his love for eternity. So don't lose faith. This, this world that we are living in is really difficult and is, um, is trying to confuse us and to make us just buy all these, all these, um, all these lies. But we let us be sure that we are, that we have this amazing um, loving father who is just waiting for us to accept him in our lives and to have a real fulfilled life, a life with purpose, a life full of joy, full of happiness. And of course, my life nowadays is not all happiness. I have problems like everyone else and, and um, challenges every day and temptations, but this time I'm not alone because I'm with him. I'm part of his, I'm part of his, um, of his team. And he's there with me all the way, step by step, guiding me and giving me the strength to, um, to, uh, to go and to, and to move forward in my life with all these challenges. So it really is very different living with God. I wouldn't go back in my life um, because I know that now my life has a, has a meaning and it has a purpose. And it, it is full of his love. So um, that's the, the main message that I would give. Thank you so much, Ariana. And, and thank you for taking your time to granting us this interview. And, and praise God for all that he's done in your life and will continue to do in, in your life and through the fruits of your consecration to our loving lady and, and to her immaculate heart. Um, so that concludes our interview for today. Thank you so much. And may the grace of God be with you. Thank you and praise the Lord. Amen. Amen.